All right, everybody, we got a very special treat for you guys today. This is going to be a lot of fun. We have actually two guests with us here today on our Survivor podcast. Uh, you know them both from Survivor Blood vs. Water. Of course, Laura comes to us also from Survivor Samoa. Uh, so please welcome, they have a total three-time appearances between them, Laura Moret and Sierra Easton. Hi. How are you guys doing? We're good. How are you? I'm doing. I'm very good. That uh, we did this with uh, John, Cody, and Candice a couple of weeks ago, and it was a lot of fun. So I'm looking forward to another uh, two Survivor interview at the same time. Okay, we'll do our best. Yes. All right. Well, how are you guys doing? First of all. What's up? How are you guys doing? First of all. We're doing good. We're doing good. She got back to reality. Put our weight back on. Finally forgave her for voting me off. Oh, well, that was very nice of you. <laughs> uh, now, Laura, now, uh, I, I like that you have a pen and a pad in front of you. This is a, actually, I think a Rob is a podcast first. I've never had a, a guest who is, is going to be taking notes during the podcast. Yeah, and actually, if you can see it, it's Layla's, my granddaughter's spelling words for the week. <laughs> and you're writing on the back? And I'm writing on the back, yeah. So <laughs> All right, I'm well, taking good notes. That's good. By the way, that this also uh, this interview is uh, also being broadcast on our YouTube channel, so you can watch the video of this if you're listening to us uh, in the audio, and you can actually see Laura and Sierra in this conversation on our YouTube channel at robhaswebsite.com/youtube. Okay, so uh, all right, Laura and Sierra, let's get yeah. let's talk about this season uh, last night because we you, we're in luck because this was one of the craziest episodes of Survivor that we've had. Here in uh, probably from this this season, and maybe going back to you guys uh, picking uh, rocks last season. Definitely, I think that it's it's really fun watching a, a season of all new players. Like I don't know about you, but I was watching it thinking I would have loved to have played with these people that are on there. It, it seems like Spencer, to me, is the only one so far with a really good idea of what has happened in the past. Everybody else, it seems like they're brand new. Well, I shouldn't say that. Tony. Yeah, Tony is Tony does a really good job too. But it seems like these players are like they've never seen the game played before, and they're like, "Well, what happens if we do this?" It's like, have you not watched the show before to see what happens if you flip right after a merge? It's usually not a very good thing. So uh, I was gonna say too, um, when you're talking about the tribal being so intense, I was waiting. <laughs> like I've been watching and waiting. Like, come on! Like these tribals have been kind of predictable and like very boring. And we had so many intense tribal councils. I was waiting for one. So to finally get to see, you know, I was excited going in, and I wasn't disappointed coming out. Yeah. For All sure. right. Well, let's talk about the actual move and talk about if you liked it or not. So. I'm gonna I'm gonna go out on a limb and say that you guys uh, did not like the move for Cass to flip. Am I correct about that? Yes, I did not like it. Awful move, awful move, awful move. The way that she played the whole entire. Oops, there goes my watch. I'm excited. <laughs> oh no. The way that she <laughs> the way she played the the entire time up to tribal. The way she approached. Um, see, I Sarah. The way she approached Sarah. I give Trish so much props because she walked up to um, Cass. Cass walked up to Sarah and said, "This is what we're going to do." And Sarah said, "Nope, this is what we're going to do." And they both wanted to be queen bees, not Trish. Trish. Trish said, "You tell me who I want. You want gone, and we'll send him away." I mean, that was brilliant the way that she did that. She was so smart the way she did it. Whereas Cass and was butting heads with Sarah the whole time. I liked Tasha. I really liked the way that Tasha was trying to be the mediator between the two of them, saying, well, wait a second, what about this? The way that she was trying to cement the bond together. But what she didn't do is go back to Cass and say, look it, we got to keep Sarah tight with us and, and stroke, continue to stroke Cass and say, Cass, trust me, let's stay with it. But um, I think that for Cass, I mean, this is just my opinion. I think you always have to be thinking about if you're going to make a big move, you know, what is your outcome? Where are you going to be? And for Cass, I think she went from number one, two, maybe three in her alliance mm -hmm. to number six in another. Like, it, she just dropped a ton of numbers. I don't understand the point. She was in such 
a great spot in her own alliance with the three brains. She just dropped to number six, and I think she did it all because emotional. Oh, it was she emotional. wasn't getting along. But not only that, I felt like she kind of did it to like out of um, like to puff her chest a little bit. Like she wanted to be like, "Hey, look at me." Like Sarah was in a great spot. Now look, I'm in the spot, and I get yeah. to make the move. It's like sometimes you don't always have to be the one to decide who goes home. Just like my whole theory, as long as it wasn't, as long as it's not me. You know, and like that was Sandra, as long as it's not me. And I think that she could have learned from that. It's just because the person she wanted to go home didn't go home, she had to right. flip. And, it, and it ultimately, it just got her from spot one, two, or three all the way down to six. Yeah. Now, one of the things that's sort of come to light today, it, as Sarah's done some interviews, uh, specifically, I, I read you know, in the interview she did with your buddy Gordon Holmes, Sierra, that you do the power rankings with. By the way, who's who's winning in the power rankings? You okay, or Gordon? Gordon, Gordon is kicking my butt, but <laughs> but I gained ground this week. Okay, okay? good. And I have well, been the underdog, <laughs> and so do not count me out yet. Yeah, she never gives up. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, dig deep. Dig deep. Um, so. She said, um, Sarah had talked about how she had an alliance with Spencer and Jeremiah, and one of the things that they were working on was a plan to get rid of Cass. Does that change anything for you if down, if Sarah was working on, Sarah was building a new alliance within that group and that she was going to be coming after Cass sometime soon? And again, these sometimes these things are Monday morning quarterback or, yeah, I coulda, shoulda, woulda, but do you think that, does that change anything if Cass did start to feel like, Hey, my alliance is starting to target me. I got to get the jump on them. Okay, so here's what I'm going to say from my own experience. I had a reputation maybe being a flip flopper, right? <laughs> and you, you as viewers, saw what you saw, and you and you made your judgment. And so for me, watching this episode, I tried to be very open minded about watching it because you don't get to see everything, and you can assume that you know maybe Cass was in you know a great spot that's what we all assumed but maybe she wasn't so like I can I can be open-minded about it and I can say okay maybe there were some relationships being formed that we, that didn't, we didn't get to fully see but at the same time the way that I view it no matter how you cut it at this point at the in the merge I almost would have waited to see it out first and then maybe make your move later because she had a couple weeks, I think, until that would have happened, until you gained the numbers and then you could have done it. So I don't think it matters how you cut it. I think it was a dumb move. But at the same time, I can be open-minded about right. maybe we didn't, maybe the, the move had a little bit of more, um, I don't know, background that we didn't get to witness. We don't get to see a lot, like who goes to the water well a lot together, who sleeps next to each other at night, who does, we don't get to see a lot of that interaction of who really naturally bonds, we just get to see some conversations. So, assuming she might have been a little bit um, paranoid that she was going home, I agree with Sierra, I still don't care. You stifle that paranoia and you get your troops together and say, look it, we got to get these people gone and then, you know, we're, we're a team of six here. Laura, I want to bring this back to Survivor Samoa because going back and doing my research, I think there was a similar situation that happened with you guys, uh, and which actually when you got voted out on Survivor Samoa was that there was a scenario, I guess there was 10 people left in the game, and so there were the four people from Russell's side, and they had Shambo with them, and they had five, and then you guys had five on Galoo. Right. And so at that point in the game, they find that John Fincher wants to switch over or is thinking about switching over. And so ultimately they pull John Fincher over to uh, to vote against you. And they actually, they go to Rocks, but then in the re-vote, instead of pulling Rocks, John Fincher uh, ends up going with the other with the other side. Can you talk about the, uh, similar, the similarities? I guess you would be the Sarah in this situation. Could you talk about uh, whether or not that is similar to this at all? It is similar, and if you recall, Russell first off came to me and said, hey, come with us, turn on your tribe, and I said, absolutely not, no, and then, because he already knew I knew he had the idol, and then he went to Monica, and he said, hey, Monica, Monica Padella, not Culpepper, right. um, hey, I have the idol, do you want to go with me, and Monica once again said, oh, I don't know, and then he went to John, so we all knew that he was trying to get somebody, we already knew Shambo was locked in. And so that was a little bit of a difference is we it, there was there was more awareness that they were trying to get more people to switch but um 
with John, it, it was kind of the same thing. We went to the vote. It was a tie vote. We knew, I knew the minute that it was um, a tie vote, vote and we were going to go again, that John was going to flip. There's no way he would have drawn rocks for me. But that's what was the frustrating part was we kept telling them, if anybody flips, you're going to be the next one gone. You are the next one gone because they're gonna. We're giving them the numbers. So hold, have some kahunas like Sierra did, right? Hold strong and make them draw rocks. And the one with the smallest kahunas folded. <laughs> and and then what ha What happened to John Fincher after after he flipped and voted with the other side? He joined me at the Ponderosa. <laughs> He was the next one to go out. Um, do you feel like that a similar thing could happen with Cass? Um, now that was probably, I don't think she's going to go out next week, but you have to imagine, you know, you had Cochran in Survivor South Pacific. You have this instance with uh, Fincher where he flips around 10. Do you think that Cass is going to suffer a similar fate to these two guys? Here's why I don't think she does. Uh, opposite of what I just said. Because at this point, Everybody wants to take Cass with them to the final because she's not getting anybody's votes. She's Interesting. So many people off. If I was there, I would be. I would be saying, "Oh, Cass, it's me and you. Let's go to the end." Because anybody can beat Cass at this point. There's a lot of game left. I know there's a lot of game left, but I think that at this point, I would be saying, "Cass, if you want to gain favor, we we need to get a group together and start start building up your resume a little bit better than what it is now." So if she can make it through these next couple of tribals without getting voted out, she has a great shot, if you want to be a goat, of being somebody's goat and getting carried to, I think it's the final two. I Rumor had it they only have two this season. I could be wrong. But getting to the final because everybody's going to want to sit next to Cass at this point. I kind of have a different viewpoint. <laughs> oh, well, let me let me just say about that. That's actually uh, interesting, and uh, we hadn't we hadn't thought about that yet. About that is Cass somebody that you would want to try to take with you to the end. Um, th that's a, a different spin on it, and actually, I have to uh, think about that for a little bit because it it is a good idea. But uh, let me hear what Sierra has to say, and then we'll we'll talk more about this. Okay, I I, I can see that viewpoint, but I'll, at the same time. I have learned from experience that when you do flip, it makes it so difficult for anybody to trust you. I couldn't see somebody trusting her enough to take her that far because in my mind, I would be thinking, okay, you know, me and Cass, final two, final three, I, I would beat Cass. The issue is along the way, is Cass going to turn on you? And I think that that's going through everybody's mind is you can't you can't trust her. And, and I've seen in a lot of situations, I think about Tyson, Jervis, and Monica, you, you don't ever trust anybody 100%, but they had enough trust in each other to know, okay. They don't trust anybody ever 100%. But at, the, but at the same time, I'm just saying you have to trust somebody to get to the end. You have to. And I could see Cass, not, nobody trusts her at this point. Everybody knows she's a flip-flopper. Nobody wants to take her that far because they're worried that she'll screw them over. Yeah, this is a good point about the debate over can you bring somebody with you to the end. I mean, my kind of gut feeling is that you, that it, this is too far from the end to start feeling like, okay, I'm going to drag this person with me to the end. But we've seen it done before, like Boston Rob with Philip, And uh, I guess you could even say, uh, maybe tell me if, if this is incorrect, uh, Tyson and Jervis with Monica, was were they thinking about uh, let, let's get to the end with Monica because we can beat her from this point in the, in the game? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I, I would like to say yes, and I, I'd have never actually really talked to Tyson or Jervis about when the point was where they decided that it was going to be Monica with them. Well, I think they even said early, it. But early on, they were all about getting rid of Monica. Right at the right at the merge, it was Monica gone, Monica gone, Monica gone. And, and I have never had a conversation with Tyson where I asked him, was that just... You know, what, so we didn't know how close you and Monica and Jervis were. Or were you really ever going to vote her out? Because there was a few weeks when Monica was supposed to go. But and even in but in Tyson's confessional, he said, "Look, it, we need to send Laura to Redemption Island." And Tyson and Ara said, "We need to send Laura to Redemption Island so she can beat Brad, so that Monica will have to come to us, and so that Monica will have nowhere else to go." Oh, I do, I do believe so, that there was an element of everybody wanted to take Monica to the end. I mean, it wasn't some genius move by Tyson and Jervis to take Monica. It was known around camp that everybody wanted Monica at the end. The issue was, I, I don't know if I believe that that was their plan from day 
right. one of the merge. Right. I don't know if I believe that that was their plan. Yeah, this is a, a really good point about can you go ahead and be the be the goat? Because I kind of feel like if you are aware enough to say, hey, I can't win, everybody can beat me, I kind of feel like that person is never the goat. I feel like the goat tends to think like, oh, I can win, but everybody else is like, like for instance, like the Philip. I don't think the Philip says to Boston Rob, hey, look, I can't win. Bring bring me to the end. It's sort of like somebody says, ooh, nobody's gonna, n nobody, that person's getting no votes. So you I'm going to bring them with me. You know who the goat was that won? Who? My season in Samoa. Uh, you, Natalie White. Yeah, that everybody but, felt. But yeah. here's what Natalie White did. She was a brilliant goat because she said in her speech, y'all, there's no way I could have gotten to this end. I don't camp. I don't, I'm not, you know, I can't do this athleticism. I don't, can't win challenges. So I knew I had to attach my, she confessed to being, I had to attach to myself to somebody that could get me to the end. And that was my strategy. And I'm sorry if you don't like it, but that's what I had to do. And Eric Cardona summed it up perfectly when he said this is such a dilemma. Is who played a worse game? Russell, who was just awful to everybody, but here he is at the end. Or Natalie, that didn't really do much, but her strategy was connecting herself to somebody that she knew that could. And it worked. And it worked. So, cheers for the goat. She did it. Yeah. Who who looked at each other as the goat? I guess that's the the, the question. <laughs> um, so how would how would Cass be able to take the situation that she's in and potentially say to people, "Hey, take me to the end because I can't win the game because every everybody's mad at me. You'll definitely win if you go up against me." I mean, does how does she go about doing that? I, I would say what Cass needs to do is buy herself time at this point. Mm -hmm. And so she solidified herself as number six in her alliance. So if it were me, I would just be focused on getting to six because you know that's going to buy you five more tribals. And then within that time that you bought yourself, that's when you have to start finding the cracks in that five above you. But at this point, for her to make any move, big move, She's th gone. Th that, that will make her gone. She needs to lay low from this point and get herself to the number six spot that she set herself up for, and then in the meantime, try and find cracks, try and build more relationships, and then see where she can go. Because the reality is, is if anybody sees her playing too hard again, they're all going to vote her out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you're going to get voted out for either being a, a threat, so someone's going to say, this person's a threat, we need to get him off the island, or for being somebody that you don't trust. You know, like, we, we're, she's a flip-flopper, we're not going to trust her. And so they already know that she's a flip-flopper and she's not a trust. I mean, she, she's not a threat, so she definitely needs to just lay low. But if, but if she wanted, if we're sticking with the GOAT theme, if she wanted to present herself as somebody's GOAT, hey, take me to the end, I can't win, her best bet is to get under somebody like Tony or LJ and say, like, hey, Trish. take care of me, like, I'll do whatever you want me to do, show me the ropes, like, that, that, if she wants to be the GOAT, I'm so scared, I, I don't know what to do, and, and really make them feel like, you guys tell me whatever you want me to do, and I will do it because, oh my gosh, my team is coming after me big time. I am, I don't, I have nothing else to lose at this point. But the problem is, I don't think that's who Cass is as a person. I like, know. I feel like Cochran, the, he could have got away with that. He would have, he could have yeah. said, you know, coach, whatever you wanted, I'll, I'll vote however you want me to do. I'm just a vote in your pocket, you know, take me to the end. And they still didn't. But I feel like Cass is so fiercely independent. Like, yeah. when Tony starts telling her, like, uh, Okay, guess we're gonna vote this way this week, and then she's gonna be like, uh, "Well, hold on a second, because I would rather uh, vote You're out this person." I couldn't see her playing the goat, but I'm just saying, if she wanted to, she would need to suck it up, and that's yeah. probably what she would need to do. But I, I couldn't see her doing that. Yeah, no, that's a good point. Let's talk a little bit about Tony, because a lot of people have compared Tony to Russell Hance uh, this season and the way that he's played the game. Lord, you played with Russell famously. Do you see any of Russell in Tony? None. What's, none? Oh, maybe tattoos. Maybe they have tattoos. <laughs> That's about none whatsoever. Russell, his goal was to be mean and um, biting and be this big character. But he's stupid because, again, he gets to the end and then nobody likes him because he was mean and biting 
And it's just like, you're an idiot. Nobody's going to vote for you. Tony's playing such a better game in, in yes. the sense that he, you can tell people like him. He's not personal about it. He doesn't make personal attacks, but he he's playing a great, great strategic game. He's playing hard, so he's going to get props for this guy is playing this game hard, but he's not doing it on a personal, he's not doing it on a personal le level. He's just... No, and I'm, look at he's a he's a police. My father-in-law was a retired LAPD detective. I think did you have somebody? My my dad was uh, in the NYPD for almost thirty. Okay, so NYPD, LAPD. So I have tons of respect for cops. Tony has this. He's a stand-up guy. Even though I know he swore in his badge, it's a game. This is a game, people. This is a game of Survivor. There are lines that you sometimes cross, and I know that that's that some more people have issues with it than others. But Tony, compared to Russell, is not even not even close. What's Tony is a way better player than Russell, hands down. And I'm not just saying that because I don't like Russell. I would say, yeah, Russell beat him if he did, but I am. <laughs> no. <laughs> So what is what is it about Tony that makes him better than Russell? I believe I, yeah. I think the biggest thing for me that I've noticed is every time Russell play plays, he never plays to win. Ever. I don't know why he goes out there. He's playing a game where okay, you can make it to the final three two times. Big deal. You will never win with your strategy. The game isn't let's see who can make it to final three the most. The game is who can win Soul Survivor. So it's so frustrating for me. But Tony, on the other hand, you can tell more so than just being a little bit loud and playing hard like Russell plays. Like my mom said, he's also playing strategically in relationships very smart. If you watch him around camp, he's very kind to people. You see mm -hmm. him joking with people. People want to be around him. Um, he seems to be being himself around camp. Russell was very two-faced. If you watch his confessionals, he's some loud guy who has so much to say, but then when you watch him around camp, he's this little mouse who's scared of everybody. And that's exactly, if you go back and if you watch, you have nothing to do on a Sunday afternoon. Go back and take, watch the Samoa footage. Very rarely will you see Russell talking strategy with us, tribe members. Very rarely did he do that. I mean... I don't even think he talked strategy with me. He just came in and bossed me around and told me to vote his way because he had an idol, and I told him well, no. What about the people on his side? Did he talk? Did he talk strategy? Like I, I get that you were on the other, the well, other side. Right. So I can't attest that because strategy. I wasn't there the first half of the game. But you, do, what I watched, you didn't see a lot of interaction. You just saw him on camera going, "I'm the king of the island. I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this." And then he goes back to camp, and he's like you know, like a little troll in the woods not talking to anybody. I think, too, I'm going to give Tyson props for the way that, that Tyson played the game, is when you're playing, yeah. you have to be aware of the jury. That is a huge element in this game, is the jury. And Tyson was very, very aware of, of his relationship with each person that was going to the jury. Russell could care less. And I see that right. in Tony. I see Tony has built a relationship, you know, with who just went home? Sarah. Sarah. But he did cheer when she left. That, yes. That, uh, well, let's that, talk that, about that. But, 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 they did bond over something. You don't know how people are going right. to vote. He, she could vote bitter, bitter and, and let's say Tony makes it to the final three or two or whatever and not vote because she's voting bitter. Or she could vote because she's like, wow, with the time I did spend with Tony, you know, we bonded right. over this. You just don't know. But I'm just saying he seems to be more aware of his relationship. Right. Right. Yeah, I don't think that going out of the game, I, I don't don't suspect that Sarah is bitter with Tony at this point in time. Now, maybe she comes home and watches the episodes and sees the stuff about how he lied to her about the badge and stuff like that, but I suspect she doesn't, she probably wouldn't find any of that stuff out before yeah, day 39. He really been mean-spirited. He did, he did swear on his badge and then, and then go back from it, but he wasn't mean-spirited. He hasn't said mean-spirited things about him. He's just playing the game hard, and there's mm. a big difference. But, you know, I will say that um, the jury is still at, still at, no pun intended, the jury is still out a little bit on Tony because we don't know, like, if he is going to make a run to the end of the game, we don't know how he's going to treat the other people along the way. And, you know, I is he going to be rude to people on their way out of the game? We still don't know that yet about him. So you know, it's hard made, to say. He made one comment to Trish that, you, that when, he, when Trish was talking about, let me go over there and talk to my relationship. And he made a comment like, 
no, no, she's just going to play you. He kind of, he kind of co was condescending a little bit to Trish, like, no, you're, you're not smart enough to go over there and talk to him. And I noticed that Trish didn't seem to be rubbed wrong by that. So that set, that really meant a lot to me that maybe she, had, she must really have a good relationship with Tony because it didn't rub her the wrong way when he was saying, no, 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 little girl, this is too big for you. You can't handle this. And she didn't take it that way. So he must be doing something right over there with the um, relationships. Yeah. And then ultimately she was able to handle it, which is the irony of it. And she, yeah. But let's talk about that scene at the tribal council because I can't remember another tribal like that where they where they like they started clapping after the vote. And the clapping actually started um, when LJ played his idol. Yeah. That so Tony goes up and he plays the idol for LJ. LJ yeah. goes up. He plays the idol for Tony, and then they're like, oh, this is great. And then they count the votes, and then it's the sixth vote for Sarah, and then they sort of burst out in applause. Um, you guys uh, you know, both played in some polarizing times. I, I guess uh, for either of you, if you're the, the side of the alliance or the side of the tribal politics that you weren't on was clapping after somebody from your group got voted out at tribal council, how would that change things for you? Well, Russell did when I got voted out. Oh, yeah. if, yeah. oh not only did he clap, yeah. I don't, I, I'm sure if you go back and watch some of the footages, you know, the ones that they show online, when they voted my name out, he was clapping. He was like, yeah, 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 got her. Like this, and he was like celebrating. So, yeah, he did, he did celebrate quite largely when I got sent. Out. I have something to say too, which is where I, my, my experience is different. That would, Never happened. Well, not never. Very unlikely that that would happen during a Redemption Island season because that person could be coming back. So if you're clapping, you're probably pretty right. dumb to be yeah. celebrating that somebody's coming back because when they do come back and they saw you clapping, you know, so my, my experience was a little bit different because at the tribals when somebody would leave, the thought was always they could be returning. Yeah. That's very interesting to, to see that sort of thing. And by the way, if you want to catch uh, Laura's season, that, uh, that Survivor Samoa is one of the seasons available on Hulu Plus if you want to uh, check that out. And you can get two weeks free of Hulu Plus at uh, huluplus.com slash Rob. There you go. That was uh, one of our sponsors last month. Perfect. So uh, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, some, of, some of these other players in the game. One of the other questions that I got from a lot of people was comparing somebody else in this game to somebody from Survivor Samoa. And some people have been comparing Cass to Shambo. And so I want to see if you think that's a valid comparison because we you have... Know, this go, go. last week was the first time when she was talking with Trish that I was like, oh my gosh, that totally reminds me of Shambo. Um, Shambo was a very, very emotional player. And she would stomp her feet and pout if people didn't listen to her. And I think with Cass, and again, I based on just my watching her, being one of the older players, I think Anne being educated, she's an attorney, she has this kind of chip and arrogance, like, I have some world experience, and you guys need to listen to what I'm saying. And, and when we're coming in and not listening to what she's saying, i.e. Sarah, she's getting so frustrated with that. And you can see it, you can hear it in her tone. I hear Shambo in her tone when she talks and the, the way that she doesn't think game, she just thinks emotional. And she just thinks, this, this girl's driving me crazy. I, I want, like she said, I want to punch her in the face. How ridiculous is that? Get a grip, keep it together, you're in a game. Punch her in the face later, but she can't control her emotions like Shambo couldn't. So, good analogy because I felt that just this last. Well, how yeah. do you deal? How do you deal with somebody that's that's like that oh. who is not going is you know is very emotional, has a tendency to flip to the other side. Um, she also feels like she's alienated from the the larger group now, and now she, like Shambo, she has put. The her side in a numerical disadvantage. Yeah. Well, you're asking the wrong person because I got voted out. Shamo actually went further than me. But what I would have done differently 
is, and, and you can see it time and time again, I would go to Shambo and say, Shambo, look at, you know, you are included. And she just, she, once she gets her mindset that that's the way it's going to be, there's no getting around it. And that's just what happens when you play with people like that. So I don't know. Tell me what I need to do. What do I need to do with people like that? I, I, can't, I can't figure it out. <laughs> well, I, I don't know necessarily. I think you just have, you have to you have to keep them feeling good, uh, and that's that's the problem. Now I don't know if the people in her own alliance necessarily knew how upset she was because she was upset about Sarah, but I don't think anybody was coming to her from her side to say, "Hey, Cass, are you okay? Is everything good? Is everything good with you? Are you comfortable with what we're doing?" And maybe because they didn't do that sort of check-in with her, that's why she ends up flipping. Yeah. Did you guys have to do that sort of stuff with Shambo? Did you have to go in and check in with her and see how she's feeling and take her temperature constantly? The boys did all the time, and that's why the boys definitely had the trust from Shambo, and that's why she stuck with the boys, meaning um, Eric, especially Eric. She loved Eric. Eric and Brett, Dave Ball not so much. They didn't, they didn't get along as well. But Eric and Brett were constantly reaffirming Shambo. Shambo, look at I know you guys aren't getting along, but let's let's hold it together and stay together. But you know, some people just can't they can't look past their personal feelings and it's to their demise, like what happened with Cass. And unfortunately, I I don't know. I mean I don't know the outcome, but I would be surprised if um, Cass wins. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if she goes to the end, like I said, because somebody may want to take her at this point, but um, I'd be surprised if she wins. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about the people who are making the, the mistakes, but who, in your opinion, are the people that you think have a shot to really go far here? Who do you, who do you think is able to make it to the end? You can go. Okay, so I love Trish. I think Trish, as, as much as she, you can hear the, I know, the viewers don't like her, and I know that a lot of the cast members, or the, you can see that the, her other tribe mates have issues with her, but let me tell you something, that girl is doing good, not only, here's what I liked, not only was she wise enough to go to Cass and say, you tell us who you want to do it, and we'll do it, she must have some type of power, because she was able to go back to her tribe and convince her entire tribe, let's all vote Sarah. They must trust her because how do they know Sarah wasn't blowing smoke? And I mean, Cass wasn't blowing smoke, and Cass wasn't just saying, "Oh yeah, we'll vote out Sarah," and then they waste their votes. So her, so she must have some huge amount of trust and power to go back and get all of her teammates to vote for Sarah. Love that. She's very observant. She noticed that the rift was between them when she was at the fire. Um, her downfall, though, is, is she's kind of like Cass in that point where she is aggressive. I mean, who one right here am I talking about the aggressive women? But um, we recognize that in each other. And so sometimes it's nothing that you do on purpose. It's just something that you put off. And but the good part is that she's on the tribe with Tony and um, Wu. She has all those big guys who are looking at this probably 90-pound woman at this point, going, "You are no threat to me." You are no physical threat to me. But you can't do that in the game because what if they have to hang on a pole? Huh? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Then she's staying up there forever. But but I think that they're not seeing her as a physical threat. But isn't that good? That is. That's what I'm saying. That's great yeah. that they're not seeing her as a physical threat, but yet she's still... But at the same time, we've seen a side of Trish with, like, Lindsay that was so... Um, dumb and like I just thought Lindsay was a baby hard to okay let's just say Lindsay's a baby Lindsay's, Lindsay's the biggest baby. fine Trish handled it so 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 wrong I just I just have a heart I just see in her like you said she's I feel like she's also emotionally playing the game I feel like if Tony I, or if somebody were to do something or say something to her, I feel, feel like her alliance would crumble, just yeah. how Cass is. Well, hiding. actually, let's, let's talk about Lindsay for a second, because in Survivor Blood vs. Water, uh, Laura, you were on the tribe with Colton, who ultimately ended up quitting the game. Different circumstances, but I think that the common denominator is that both of them felt like, okay, I can't win the game, there's no point uh, for me being here. Do you give Trish any strategic credit 
for really uh, forcing the issue, for making making her come out of the game. Maybe and maybe in the, in the same way that some of the guys from Survivor Blood versus Water maybe led to Colton voting himself out of the game by quitting. Tons, because you know what, Trish ultimately won. They were fighting. Trish and Lindsay were fighting this whole time, and Trish won. I mean, she won the battle. She got her to quit. Whether she did it on purpose, that I'm sure that wasn't her intent to get her to quit on purpose. I don't. I'm not saying that that was her intent. But what I'm saying is. Lindsay comes out of the game and she's talking about how, you know, she did it for her daughter and how it was a good example and how tough that she really is. No, you're not. A tough person doesn't necessarily just, a tough person learns how to resolve the issue, not necessarily, like she said, I'm just walking away because I would have beat her up. How immature is that? That's ridiculous. So Colton, on the other hand, when he was he was frustrated because he was trying to start drama around the camp and I would say don't talk to me and Jervis would say don't talk to me and Aris would say don't talk to me and Tina would say don't talk to me and Kat would be the only one that would interact with them and they would just be fighting like kids in the backseat of the car over your hand touched my hand and that's as the parents were like seriously neither one of you are going to get ice cream if you guys don't stop fighting and Finally, I pulled Kat alongside the beach and I said, Kat, I'm going to just tell you something. If you don't stop fighting with him, you're going to go home because we are tired of you guys fighting all day. And to Kat's credit, Kat did. Kat is the one that I credit with why Colton quit is because Kat finally said, Colton, say what you want. I am done talking to you. And when he saw he couldn't manipulate Kat anymore, that is when he quit. So... Um, I, you know, I want to just give Kat props for that because I know she gets a lot of flack for some things, but she, that's, I credit her for having him quit, but it's frustrating playing with people that quit. Very interesting. Um, Sierra, now this season we had a professional athlete play uh, in this season with uh, Cliff, R Cliff Robinson. Uh, was there any sort, we saw a lot of the people looking up to Cliff Robinson. Uh, was that similar to how things were with Brad Culpepper where the people <laughs> in, the, in the tribe just gravitated to him? Okay. <laughs> Who's Brad Culpepper? I mean, come on. <laughs> like, Cliff Robertson, Brad Culpepper? Like, the second I saw Cliff Robertson, I mean, we are from Oregon. Rip City. So we do, we are blazer lovers. So Cliff is like, ah. When I heard Brad Culpepper, I literally Googled, like, Brad. Everybody thinks that's Dante, Dante Culpepper. He's black, right? And I'm like, no, it's Brad Culpepper. I think he played for the Bengals or somebody. <laughs> so it is, it is not terrible in that sense. But, uh, I believe I, I believe he was with the uh, the Vikings and and the Bucks and the Bears. I think the Red Sox. No, 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 no. <laughs> but okay, I will use this. This um, Brad Culpepper, being an athlete, wanted to lead a team. I mean, he wanted he would rally the troops. It yeah. would be, come on, guys! Like I'm gonna tell you all my football stories, and we and we all let him take that rollover. And I could definitely see in Cliff, maybe, like, uh, um, he wanted to have a united team. Like, I don't know, I, I almost felt like when they would look to him at, for challenges and kind of little things like that. But Brad was so much more um, loud about mm -hmm. it and, like, very upfront with his role as leader. I didn't really see Cliff ever step up as a leader. And I almost wonder if that was maybe a downfall for him because he was so likable. He was so likable, and then at the same time, you never – I didn't even see him strategize one time. I mean, like, like it was almost – Jervis like, didn't either, remember? Okay, I know, I know, <laughs> Jervis didn't either. But I, I just – I wish – I think maybe he should have – I'm not making a black comparison. So it's not the most, <laughs> that wasn't a race. I wasn't sure, yeah. <laughs> I almost wonder if Cliff would have stepped into the role of like being the leader a little bit more if it would have gotten him further in the game. Because Tony stepped right into that role and people started listening to him. Yeah. I don't, I don't know. But yeah, Brad Culpepper and, and Cliff, I, I don't know. Okay. I've got a bunch of questions here for you guys. And, uh, well, you know, there's so many more things that we could talk about. But let's get into some of the questions from the listeners of Rob Has a Podcast. This comes to us on our from our Facebook page at facebook.com slash Rob Has a Podcast. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and let's start with uh, Gavin Costello. 
Uh, and he has a question. And he wants to know, is there anything that Spencer can do to flip this game back again? Uh, who should he try to flip and when? Oh. How does Spencer get back in the game? I know you guys are big Spencer fans. I love Spencer. I love Spencer. What is it about him that you guys like so much? Well, remember that once? I'm a, I'm a challenge junkie, right? So when I see people doing good on challenges, I'm like, that's who I want on my team. Do you remember that one in the swimming one when they had to dive down and untie the things and come back up and do it? He did the whole entire thing because the girls couldn't even go down, so he would he'd bring the block back up, set it back down there, and Jeff would go in. Spencer's going again! So he's good at challenges. He's smart. I've not heard one person say one negative thing about him. Early, early on, too, I, he, I watched him. He knows when to hold his tongue and when to lay low. Like at the beginning with like David going home, at like the very early, early stages in the game. And then also, as you watch, he's kind of let Tasha and Cass make some of the decisions, but mm -hmm. you know he has it in him to be vocal because we've seen his preseason interviews. When I saw his preseason interview, I did not like him. I'm like, this guy is an idiot. But then as you watch, he knows he knows what how to hold that in and when to voice and when to not. But in regards to what he can do, I wonder if his best move uh, Sarah said it in her interviews, and you've kind of witnessed that maybe Spencer is close with Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. So if it were me, I would keep my Tasha, because you know Tasha has your back, and I would keep my Jeremiah, and I would Bring see, the and you have Morgan, even though Morgan and Jeremiah had bad blood, if we can maybe bring in the beauties, maybe Jeffra, maybe LJ, I don't know, but I, I would maybe go the route of trying to get the beauties, because I feel like the brawn... They're gonna stick together. I feel like Tony and Trish, and then I and and Wu. I feel like the three of them are pretty um, tight. So I would maybe focus on on the beauties and the the relationship he has with Jeremiah, and use Jeremiah's relationship with the beauties. All right, two follow-ups. Uh, as far as Spencer being able to hold his tongue, he did not do such a good job at the tribal council last night. <laughs> After the votes were read, I think he 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 was like. Way to go, Cass. That I'm you, not you have a zero I, chance to win now. I guarantee I, I disagree. I don't feel like he needed to hold his tongue in that instance. Obviously they were gonna be pissed. It was no secret. Like I would be like, what the F just happened? <laughs> I don't think that in that instance he needed to hold his tongue. I, I, I don't. I feel like when he needs to, he does. Because at that moment he clearly was gonna be upset. And obviously everybody knew. Cass can't win now. I mean, like she, if she does, I will be, I will be blown away. But, but I'm just saying, like I don't feel like that was an instance where he needed to. On the other hand, I say kudos to Jeffra. Right after that happened, how she leaned over to Cass and totally call her out. Right, just confirming, just because she doesn't know. Cass could come back and say it wasn't me, but just confirming. She goes, Cass, thank you so much. Calling out, let. Thanks for flipping for me, girl. But was that strategy? I think it was. It, no, it I don't worked. Think, no, yeah. I have an issue with Jeffra. You what like is that? Her. I do like her. Like, if I were out there with her, a total uh, friend. She seems very sweet. But what is she doing? Like, the girl like seems like she's out there with no concept of like anything. Like, she doesn't want to make any moves. She doesn't want to stir the pot at all. Like, we're playing Survivor. Like, I just I don't see any strategy. When she made that comment to Cass. Great, it was a great comment, but did it seem like she intentionally said it? No. It just seemed like she really was emotionally a wreck and was about to cry and thank the girl. Like it didn't yeah, seem but like you there don't was all, But from my experience, you don't always want to be making moves. You want to just make sure that you're not in the crossfires. And I think that it's and people will say it's playing under the radar. So what so what do you want her to do? Run out there in the middle of the road and start waving your arms around like, wait, I got a big move to do. No, if people are making big moves and you know that you're not the one in the crosshairs, sit back and let him go. I agree with that, but at the same time, let's just Jeffrey can go as far as she wants to go unless she does right. something. Right. She has to start building her resume for the end. Right. It doesn't have to be something huge, right? And maybe she'll but just, maybe she'll draw rocks like just she did. something she could say. Oh, wait a second, guys! When she's sitting in front of the jury, I did d convince LJ and Trish to do this, and I did decide to do this. Like she has to start thinking that way. There has to be something she does. At this point, she's the go. Yeah. Well, maybe she says, "I'm going to go to the end with Tony, and I'm going to be Natalie White." Yeah, and but, then that's where but I Tony's like Tony. no Russell. Yeah. Yeah. Just kidding. Tony. She doesn't know who Natalie White is. Yeah, and Tony's no Russell, and. 
you know what? And you never know. Like I said, you got to wait. You you got to choose when you're going to make your moves. And I don't think that you can necessarily always force a move. Sometimes in the game that you play, you just some people don't ever get the opportunity to necessarily say, "Now's my chance." Like the obvious with Cass and Sarah, and also. For Jeffra, and maybe we just didn't see it, but if I knew my name were on the chopping block, which I don't even know if she really did, well, she has, you have to assume that it is at all times. Instead of having Trish go talk to Cass, I would have been a little bit more proactive in saving my own butt. Like, I just didn't see, I don't see her ever um, fighting or, like, or like building any relationships. Really, I think she, she was clueless that her name was brought up. I think they were all, like... Yeah, I agree. Like... Jeff, you're going for her? You have these big macho guys and you go for our tiny little blonde? What the heck? So I think yeah, they were all caught true. off guard. Which was why it was kind of a brilliant move for them to do it if Cass wouldn't have flipped. Yeah. Now, for Spencer, going back to the Spencer thing, should Cass still be on the table for them? Should those guys try to work on bringing Cass back into the fold and say, okay, look, no harm, no foul. Sarah's gone. We've learned. We've learned the error of our ways. Come back with us, Cass. Or should they just write her off? That forget about Cass and work on a new plan. Don't write her off. I wouldn't write her off. I, I don't think you should ever write. No. What they should be doing is saying it's okay, Cass. You know. She won't believe them. Come on. It doesn't matter if she doesn't believe them. They should still do it. They should appear yeah. like they're open to it. That's just what they should do. But they should also know that there's no way that Cass is going to believe that they forgave her. But there's doesn't matter in this game. You don't know what's going to happen in two seconds. Tony could go. Tony and Trish could turn on Cass, and then Cass has nobody. But if you had Cass, maybe stroking her a little bit and saying it's okay, come back, and she has nothing to fall back on, she's going to come back to you. I just don't right. feel like you should close the door. Right. You want to get like, the open door. But I, but at the same time, if I were Spencer and Tasha, I would never trust her. Right. But I, but they should appear to be open, I would I would think. And that just goes along with how good of a Tyson liar are you? <laughs> you know, can you convince, perfect example, the boy wrote my name down three times, three times, and I still believed, I still trusted him and believed him because he was an amazing player. He made you feel like, Laura, trust me. I know I wrote your name down and I know this, but, you know, we, we got your back. We got your back. And Everybody felt like they were closest to Tyson. Yes. Everybody. So it depends on, I'm not saying that it can't be done, but that's a, that's a, a honed skill <laughs> that Tyson has there. And I don't know if Tasha and Spencer can do that. They're awfully smart. Um, but with Spencer's comment, it doesn't. I don't know if after that comment, he he could ever right. really like come right. back from that. But at the same time, I don't blame him for saying it. I hope that we answered your question, Gavin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's a question from Vincent Lee, and a lot of people have this question. Uh, not not exactly phrased the same way, but let me let me give you the question. Uh, after the final duel on Redemption Island last season, which Laura M won, uh, John Cody mentioned that in hindsight he should have taken his socks off for a better grip. Uh, maybe he should have just worn his trainers. Uh, Wu clearly had an unfair advantage in the immunity challenge last night. Are there any rules as to what is allowed and what isn't allowed, or does Jeff just make it up as he goes along? So mm -hmm. I got this question in about you know 30 different ways uh, in the last uh, 12 hours or so. Everybody in that doghouse challenge last night was all barefoot except for Wu, who had the who had basically the shoes, and it was like the sort of like uh, shoes that have like the like the individual, the individual sleeves toes. for each toe. Yeah. Yes, creepy. And and yes, and people wanted to know why did Wu have those shoes and nobody else did and everybody else was barefoot in that challenge? Um, that just has to do with what clothes he brought out there. You know, obviously there's so much that goes into wardrobe that can't be discussed, but those were his game shoes that he had. Before every challenge, you are allowed as much time as you need to ask any question that you want. You can say, can we do the shoes on or off? And, um, Sometimes they even let you practice. Like on my la my very, very last challenge where I had to put my foot on the thing and balance it, they let us decide what leg we wanted to use, what was a stronger leg. So you have the option whether you want to do it with shoes or without shoes, and it's your personal choice on what you decide. On my poll challenge, John actually did start off with his shoes on, and he had his shoes on, but he has said <laughs> his feet were huge, and the little 
things were so tiny that you had to put your feet on. He thought, I, the rubber in my shoe won't even fit in this. So he kicked it off, went down to his socks, and then that was even worse for him. So you do get a chance. It was just smart of Lou to say, I'm doing this with my shoes. Yeah, I went back and I was looking at what footwear they all had, and everybody else sort of had like regular sneakers. So a uh, Wu had a very smart footwear choice very uh, to, to wear those. If you, if either of you went back and played Survivor again, would you go with those kind of shoes for the shoes that you would wear? No, they're ugly. <laughs> That's why. Never, never sacrifice beauty for comfort. I mean, come on, I you don't want to be seen in the show with those aqua aqua fin <laughs> shoes on. Are you kidding me? Ciara, that's the same for you? Yeah, they're, they creep me out, the individual toes. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're good because I had the hardest time with keeping, like, sneakers dry on there. It's like your sneakers get wet, and it takes, like, you, you know, three Birkin days socks? for them to dry. Do you wear Birkin socks? Uh, no. How come? They're so comfortable. No, I never even, I never even heard of them. Yes, you have. No, I don't. <laughs> I just had regular sneakers. Uh, that we had dro like they dry quick. Yeah, we had good shoes. Okay, uh, here's a question from Ari Feinberg. Okay, let's go back to uh, uh, going back to the comparison to Shambo. So, Laura, in your game in Samoa, like Sarah, uh, you were accused of bullying by Shambo. Actually, last night, uh, Sarah accused Cass of bullying, and Cass also <laughs> accused. Uh, Sarah of bullying. What do you think of the use of this term in reality TV? Do you think there are any real cases of bullying or is the term just completely overused? I am so tired of this word bullying because it's totally just diminished when somebody in real life, not on a reality show, but in, in school when these kids are really actually getting bullied, everybody's just throwing it around now as just like, so when somebody yells bull, it's like the boy that crawled, cried wolf. No one's going to come anymore. Bully, bully. Like Monica Culpepper was bullied. Yeah. That, too much, <laughs> too much uh, the bullying talk. I agree. You should, so you got to put a dollar in the jar every time you say somebody was bullied on reality TV. Okay. How about uh, this question from Jennifer Knott. She wants to know, Tribal Council seems to have become a place over the last few seasons where people are being more daring and not coming in and executing a typical plan that most are aware of. What is Sierra's view on how Tribal Council has changed over recent seasons, particularly in light of the rock drawing incident last season? And this is something that we've talked about a lot of our survivors becoming more, has the game evolved now to the point where tribal council matters more than ever because people, instead of where in the early seasons, okay, this is what the plan is, and no matter what happened on tribal council, somebody could murder somebody else at tribal council, but the people, the vote would stay the same because that's what everybody decided beforehand. Now we see more and more people uh, like yourself changing their decisions at tribal council. Do you think this is really a thing, that the, how the game has evolved now? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Um, one thing about this season that irritated me so much was um, when Jatia was told that it was probably going to be her and she threw the rice away in the fire. Okay, let's stop for a second. Has she not been watching what happens at Tribal Council? Like, the game is not over until your torch is snuffed. It's just not. And so when you're told you're going home, Let's use Hayden now, like from my season, as an example. Hayden knew it was probably going to be him. And instead of going and destroying everybody's everything and, and being throwing a jerk. it, being a jerk, he, he went into tribal council and said, "We, I'm going to make something happen. Because nobody knows what is going to happen. I don't know why it's evolved that way. Maybe Jeff has gotten way better at his job because he asked the question that is like, Oh, just the perfect question that you just want to be like, yeah, well, wait a second. You know, like, he just asked the right questions. The timing is intense. Everybody's wondering everything. For me in particular, a question maybe that I hadn't been thinking about might be brought up by Jeff, or it might be the way somebody answered a question, the way Jervis answers, and Jervis counts out, oh, yeah, I know we got us, one, two, three, four, and points to me at four, then I'm like, idiot like you just told me I was a four so it's and true. Tyson was behind her rubbing her back going it's okay Sierra it's literally okay. he's literally. like <laughs> you're not four. and Monica and Jervis are like you're four I'm like Tyson I love you but I'm not uh -huh. stupid so anyway it's true and, and this season you saw it with Jutia it just made me so frustrated because it's never over and especially in tribal council anything anything could happen it could switch out a second 
just with one word that somebody answers a question the wrong way, somebody looks at you the wrong way. Um, Anything. Anything. Anything could change that. And, and believe me, if you look at somebody the wrong way and Jeff sees you looking at somebody the wrong way, oh, he's going to call you out and he's going to say, Laura, I just noticed that you looked over there and rolled your eyes, looked at Sierra and rolled your eyes. Looks like you might have some animosity. And he totally calls out, even if it wasn't there, even if I was rolling my eyes because I had something in it. And then all of a sudden there's that question as, why is Laura rolling her eyes? Is she not, doesn't believe this? And he puts doubt in people's mind. When you walk, go to these tribals and you feel so secure, that's why I just would stare into the fire and just listen. I was just like, don't look at me, Jeff. <laughs> I'm not rolling my eyes. I'm not doing anything. But, yeah, and you saw it with Caleb and Brad Culpepper. I mean, in our season, we had so many intense tribal councils. I, I think that it was a, I don't know, watching this season, not only was I waiting for an intense tribal, but I, I was very aware and watching people's body language, their response to questions, Jeff's questions. And tribal council is a big part of it. Well, I, I agree with everything that you said. And I also think that we are sort of like in the beginning of this stage of the evolution. Because the people who played this season didn't even see Survivor Blood vs. Water. So when Survivor 29 comes around and Survivor 30, then the people that play in those seasons will have seen what happened when Caleb says, hey, I'm going to vote 3-3 three, three here, and you guys can do what you want. Right. And they have seen now where Hayden says, hey, why don't we, ch why don't we change this vote around? And, and, you, and you say, you know, that's right. Let me, I'm going to play for rocks. And I think that as the game continues to go forward, I think we will see more people sort of making moves on the fly. I think it's sort of like, uh, you know, people will be like, doing more, okay, well, this is actually better for me, and I think then you'll see people reacting to things happening at Tribal Council. I think the game is just going to continue to just move at a faster and faster speed as I more love, and more people I love it. Tony's um, pulling the idol out and showing his tribe and saying, what are we going to do with it in front of everybody? And then everybody right then had to reevaluate their votes in front of each other. Like, that right there is an example of something that wasn't expected to have happen, and then they had to re-go, and they had to use code, and they're like, stick with you original, or whatever they said. The first one, the other one. I was yeah. like, oh, who's the other one? You know, like, I, I was, like, curious to know, but I thought was another example of how things can change at Tribal yeah. Council and how the game is evolving to where people don't just go in with their mind made up. You know, that's a great time to change somebody's mind. All right, Dan Heaton wants to know, is there ever a good time to be a swing vote? Sierra was in that position in Blood vs. Water and nearly made it work, but it's still precarious. So is there a best time to be the swing vote? All the time. You want to be the one that, I think, I think you want to be the one, but you have to also play it like you don't know you're the one. Exactly. Like I feel like Sarah saying, I don't, I'm the swing bow, everybody needs to convince me, nobody trusts you at this point, you want to make this side feel like, no, no, I'm voting with you, and this side, and then you want to tell the, the confessional, I can decide which one exactly. I want to do, you don't want to tell everybody else that you're the swing bow, right, you, you yeah. don't want everybody to know you're a swing bow, but you want right. to know right. that you are. Yeah, that's that's that is really the key. That that when you say I know I'm the swing vote, but the problem is when everybody knows you're the swing vote, that's then not, it's yeah, that's it's, like it's that. very bad. It's actually very very bad because then uh, people are blaming you for whatever happens at the tribal council. Right, and for the rest of your life, <laughs> <laughs> for some people. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, here's an interesting question. Will Dennison wants to know, uh, would you rather be seen as cute or hot? Uh, now, this was something that happened earlier in the season where LJ said, hey, I don't trust Morgan. She's hot, not cute. Is that a real thing? Is it better to be cute than hot on Survivor? <laughs> I just like to be called one of them. <laughs> <laughs> you don't care. I don't care. I don't know. I feel like... Probably I cute. felt like Alexis was hot. I don't know. I didn't. I didn't like that he used the comparison cute or hot. It's like she's a beautiful woman, and Morgan is a beautiful woman. And if you're so intimidated, then you probably don't be. I know, but in the reality, I mean, come on. I think what he's saying is cute is oh, I'm gonna take her home to mom. Hot is oh yeah, I'm getting lucky tonight. That's okay. what I think. And that's bad. You got to vote that person out. <laughs> I, I, no, not necessarily. But I think that that's probably the. The two differences between them. Cute is, oh, I really like her. Let's go out with my friends. And hot is, see you guys later. I'll cat call you in the morning. <laughs> um, how about Morgan? Have you guys been impressed with anything she's done this season? Yeah. 
Yeah. Actually, I, I was impressed yeah. early on when she was caught looking for the idol. I was like, idiot. But then the way she recovered so quickly, I was impressed by that. And then she got caught again. And then I'm like, girl, you need to just stop lying because you seem to be getting caught in all of your lies. But but she's done a good job so far, I think, of um, the, the, the idea, anybody but me. Like, She's been doing that. Anybody but me, who do you want to vote for? It's not like she's been outspoken about who she wants to go. But at the same time, I haven't, same as Jeffra, really seen her. She doesn't have anybody. Right. I mean, like, Jeremiah and her have a riff. She's kind of just the extra number on that tribe. She doesn't have anybody. And I would love to see her um, forge her own and, and find somebody. As the same, same as Jeffra. Like, I would love to see one of those girls show some sort of strategic... Um, Move. Move. I like. I'm impressed with Morgan because the girl is beautiful, and so you know her whole life. She's gotten a lot of attention, and she's used to probably being the star of everything. She walks in the room. She's the focus of attention for everything, and she's usually the apex of what's going on. She's done a really good job based on the edit of not having to be the center of everything, not having to get all the attention all the time. And whether that's her personality type or not, I believe that she probably does get a lot of attention in her everyday life. And it doesn't appear like she's going in like, hey, you guys, look at me over here. Or I can do this. Or flirting with the boys. Or oh, she, she's really doing a good job of laying low. Right? Do you agree? Yes. OK. OK. Uh, Antonius Noel Gary Fallow wants to know, in Sarah's Ponderosa video today, she spoke about Cass being a mother and lying to people on TV isn't a good example to her daughter. How do you guys feel about this? Is Sarah just bitter that she was voted out and taking a stab at Cass? So yes. what? Yes. It's as simple yeah. as that. I mean, come on. You're you're playing the game of Survivor. I mean, like I would have sworn on. There was a lot of things I would have sworn <laughs> on out there and not even like thought thought twice about it. Like the people who have such a concept of like, okay. I love that she respected her badge enough to swear on her badge, totally. and it was such a big deal to her that she didn't want to go. I love that. But at the same time, what do you know what you're signing up for? Like, in, like you, you might have to do that. You know, In that moment, if she would have looked at Tony and said, I swear on my badge, even though she probably wouldn't have, she probably wouldn't have gone home. I mean, she probably Tony would have felt no need to play the idol, and either would LJ. And her game would have been totally different. I respect it. But at the same time, this you isn't hold somebody. This else. isn't the game for you. Don't sign up for the game because if you're not willing to do things like that, um, don't do it. Why well, use Lindsay as an example for going home to try and be, you know, you used it earlier, an example to her daughter. Okay, well, the better example would have been to come back and kick everybody else's butts and then show your daughter, look at, I triumphed, I never gave up, and then I won. Like, I, in my mind, that would have been the better example. So I think Sarah is maybe a little bit bitter, which is normal, you know, mm -hmm. when when you get voted out, especially blindsided. Yeah. And and you can see that Sarah had higher standards for herself. You can't put your standards, what you have for yourself, on anybody else. And Sarah had really high standards for herself. I'm not going to lie on my badge. If she was a mom, she wouldn't lie to be a bad example for her kids. But you can't place your standards on somebody else when they're playing the game. Is Sarah a mom? I don't think so. So I think that would also say a lot, too. If she was a mom, maybe I might have been like, okay, she kind of understands, but the fact that maybe she's not even a mom, I don't think she has any room to try and... You lie to your kids all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes they vote you out, too. And sometimes they vote, lie to you all the time. It's yeah. All right, uh, this is a question from Nathan Bayless, and he actually has, it's in the form of a poem, okay? So let me uh, give you this poem and then get your answer. I have a question from, for Laura Moret about a final tribal no survivor fan can forget. For the winner, she gave her vote to Natalie White, a vote many fans say was not right. They say Russell Hance played a better game in a style which brought him a lot of praise and fame. While others say Natalie's social game showed more class, at her final tribal council preference kicked Russell's ass. So can you put this debate finally to rest? Natalie or Russell in Samoa, who was best? Now you touched on this earlier before, but I felt like Nathan did such put so much work into his poem. I felt like I had to ask the question. I, and I wish I was creative enough to answer back in a poem. I can rap. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. You can't do it. Uh, 
Okay. I think that the vote, I think she got, Natalie got everybody's vote, but let's recap the players here. The two players that we really talked about tonight, the other characters, John Fincher and Shambo. Those were the only two people that voted for Russell Hans. All of the rest of the same cast all voted for Natalie. But what, and the reason I say that is what the viewers didn't see is the viewers didn't see Natalie's final speech. That is what did it. We were all voting for Mick going in there. Mick gave away the million dollars. We all had, we were all voting for Mick. But Mick wouldn't say what he did to get to himself to that spot. So we were all frustrated. We were like, oh, great, now what? But Natalie stepped up, and that's when I said earlier, Natalie gave this speech of, this is how I played my game. I basically rode coattails, but that's, I knew I had to do that to win. And she did good. Now, when you say we all didn't felt felt like Mick didn't, so were you guys sort of like in the jury b box, sort of saying like, uh, what do you what do you think? Do, like, did you guys all reach the same conclusion, or was there some sort of like, yeah. okay, what do you guys think? When Natalie was giving her speech, we were all looking at each other like, oh my gosh, looking at looking down the line like this girl just won it. And if you go back, remember you can watch it on Zulu now. Watch Hulu, it. Hulu. Hulu. <laughs> 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 I'm so hip. If you go to Hulu, you can watch our season. And I remember putting <laughs> shut up, mine up and saying, Natalie, you just stole $1 million because we all were voting for Mick. And it was really hard because Mick was a great guy, but he just didn't bring it home. And Natalie did. Well, he puts people to sleep for a living. <laughs> that, was, that is good. Yeah. Okay, this is a question uh, for from Thomas Forsey, and he wants to know, it has been a trend in recent seasons for an older woman to make it to the end of the game and be eaten alive by the jury for moves or lack thereof she made in the game. As jury members who witnessed this happen to Monica, can you provide any insight as to why jurors react in this manner and explain what Trish, who made a great play last night, needs to do to avoid the same fate? Now okay. we've seen a lot of people, whether it's whether it's Monica Culpepper or uh, a Dawn or a Sherry, or um, I'm sure there's a, there's a couple of others that we can that we can come up with here of people. What Lisa Welchel, for instance, what what would Trish need to do differently? Okay, um, well I'm gonna just hit on Monica Culpepper and and how I feel like it's a different situation is Monica didn't do anything. Like, I mean, what was her resume? She won challenges? That's great. Everybody was throwing challenges. Like, I mean, like, I don't... Tyson Apostle had a she, hurt arm. She won the one where she ate. Okay. She hands down no, won the eating. Okay, one. let's just say, let's just humor, let's just say that nobody out there... I mean, there is the idea that people don't want to be challenge beasts, okay? It's just, that, that's what it is what it is. I can... This woman, in her first season, kicked butt in all of the challenges and, and knew, like, okay, you know, maybe that might be intimidating to people, so I'm going to, you know, try, but I don't want to come off too loud. So Tyson Apostle and his hurt arm. Tyson wasn't even competing to his to his full extent. It's not like Monica Culpepper came in and rocked our world. It's like people weren't trying because they knew they didn't want to be, like, the king. So I'm just, to give Monica the credit of winning all the challenges, in my opinion, when she said that, oh, Here's my jury speech. I won all these challenges. I'm a jury as a jury member going, that's great. Nobody was trying. But anyway, for for <laughs> what Trish to go in, I think that Trish already has started building her resume. I mean, she, she, the example of Lindsay going home, she could use that in a jury speech. You know, I push Lindsay to get her to quit. You might like it, you might not like it, but I got somebody out. Um, I went over to Cass when I saw the girls fighting. I mean, that right there shows great, great um she was observing. She sat there and saw a fight, and it might have been the smallest fight in the world, but she took it and she ran with it. And that was totally Trish. Nobody yeah. else saw that fight but Trish. She saw the weak leak in that alliance, went for it, and, and it came out. I think she's already building her alliance. I would maybe tell her to tone it down. Yeah. But, like, but, uh, and, if, and if it was me, if I was one of the older players, which I'm clearly not an older player, but if I <laughs> did fit into that category, I would use, I would play it. I would say, here's the deal. I'm twice everybody else's age. I'm not saying that to give myself kudos. I'm just saying that socially, I don't usually socialize with 20 years old. So it's uncomfortable for me to be in this social situation. So I had to adapt 
to your guys' world. And I think I did that. And so I would use that. I would use my differences in age as that's why I deserve to be here because I am a fish out of water with you guys. I have been outside the social world. I've been nursing kids. I've been babysitting, pushing strollers. And you guys have been out in the social world, and I'm not. <laughs> so I would use that as that's what I would do when I get to the final three. Let me give you one of the comments from somebody uh, watching live. This is from Arc Music Fan Club, uh, and he says, uh, "I love Sierra. I got a, a tattoo of her face on my back." Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. She's my inspiration. No, no, uh, is, that, is this for real? I want to see the picture. Yes, yeah, send, send us a picture. Oh, on his back Arc or his backside. <laughs> he said that. And what picture is it? I don't know. Arc Music Club. Uh, send, send, uh, email me that picture. Uh, Rob at Rob has a website dot com. We'll put that up on the website. Oh, that is awesome. If that's true. Um, kind of. <laughs> Aaron Shaw says, uh, "What is the funniest thing that Tyson did that both of you saw in oh. Blood vs. Water? Is there anything that you could tell us that Tyson did that was hilarious that didn't make the show?" Everything. <laughs> Breathing. Okay, and one of the things that I don't, I think he. A lot of the viewers would always say, like, Tyson, I didn't like Tyson. Tyson is the funniest person you will ever meet in your life. He has the driest, stiffest sense of humor. He will say something so cutting and so cold with this straight stone face, and a lot of times the camera would cut away, and it doesn't show him going, I'm just kidding, or, and, and we would all be cracking up laughing. So he got, a lot of people thought he was mean. He is so far from mean. He is so kind. So but, kind. But more than that, witty. he was so entertaining. He would, okay, he would sing this, I don't know, you know the 50, nifty United States. And then, have you oh, the, all the 50 states? He sings the 50 states, and he would sing it again and again with, like, expression. Like Broadway. And he would dance, and he, would get, and he knows it, like, by heart. It's creepy. It's something you learn in, like, kindergarten. And he would sing it to us all the time. And then um, Colton left his sweater and <laughs> Colton left his sweater <laughs> and like baby blue sweater and Vetus' sweatpants I don't know if you saw but Vetus' sweatpants <laughs> were like the ones that like are peg legged but like sag at the crotch <laughs> and so uh, uh, Tyson would put Colton's sweater on his legs and it would sag at the crotch like Vetus <laughs> and he would put his um, buff on his head and do a Vetus impression <laughs> it's just funny like he yeah. kept that's why Tyson was so great because you couldn't be mad at him because he was always making you laugh. One funny thing, really funny story, was after I got voted out the second time, and I go to show up at Redemption Island, and I totally call out Tyson and Aris, and I totally call everybody out, and I'm like, "Don't you did this, and you tur turn on me, and you did this, and I said, and Tyson... I pointed to the girls and I said, he has an idol. You guys need to know, he has the idol. And his eyes get so big. I didn't know he really had an idol. I was just blowing smoke, but I didn't know that he really did have it. And I was like, remember when our food came? I saw Tyson put something in his pocket. So Tyson has an idol, and I'm totally calling him out at, Travel Camp or at Redemption Island. Then I win the challenge. I go back. Little did I know at that point, after I just threw Tyson and RS under the bus, Jeff goes, everybody drop your buff. We're drawing for new buff. And they get on the tribe with Sierra. And Sierra's thinking, great, my mom just completely slaughtered these guys, and now I'm on the team. So I show up for the next Redemption Island, and I have no idea the tribe swapped, right? Because we don't know what's going on. So I walk to Redemption Island, and Tyson's on one side of Sierra like this. And Aris is on the other side of Sierra with their arms around her, and they're like waving at us. <laughs> and it, it was just one of those things where it was, you couldn't be mad you at him. You couldn't be mad at him. Yeah. I mean, you're on Redemption Island, but it's it was all in fun. Yeah, I'm I'm a big Tyson fan. Uh, that uh, yeah. he's he really he is a hilarious guy. Uh, great great guy in, inside and and out of the game. Um, Perrick later wants to know if you suspect someone in the opposite alliance has the idol. Who do, how do you decide who to vote for? Now, unfortunately, uh, you guys in Samoa ended up choosing wrong, or maybe you didn't know Russell had the idol, right, when uh, right. Kelly went home, right? right. Well, m mind you, remember, go back and watch, the, the first time we voted and we actually got rid of Eric, Russell thought we were voting for him, so Russell's like, I'm going to play this idol, like, he's all just like, ha, 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 I'm going to get you, and he plays his idol, and then we vote for Russell, and we're, or we vote for Eric. 
and he's just like, okay, shoot, I just raced my Russell. And then, like magic, Russell has another idol, apparently. And then that vote, we were trying to tell the people to switch to split the votes. Me and Monica were saying, you guys, let's split the vote. And John Fincher, the rocket scientist, who's really good with numbers apparently, <laughs> was saying Get, was saying, getting numbers? With numbers. Oh, okay. Yeah, not getting numbers, but apparently he's really good with numbers. And he's like, We don't need to split the vote. We don't need to split the vote. You're getting paranoid. And it, and at that point, Monica and I were we wish everybody knew we were tight. We didn't want to be so assertive. We didn't want to play a Sarah and say, no, we need to split right now because this is what we need to do. So we kind of played that, okay, do you guys think this is the right move? And to our detriment, we should have been more aggressive and said, we need to split these votes because then we would have revoted and Russell and somebody else on FOFO would have went home. Well, talk me through the psychology of how do you pick the person to if they you know one side has an idol. How do you pick? It's sort of like a shell game of it's like that scene in the Princess Bride of like I know that you know that I know but that you know. But therefore, being a civilian, you cannot put it in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I think a lot of it has to do with who you think has the idol, and I I'll give you an example of when we went to Rocks. I was fairly confident Tyson had the idol. So at that moment when I'm sitting there, I knew Katie and Hayden were going to vote Tyson. That's what they told me they were going to vote before we went in. We were going to vote Tyson. I knew, I didn't know, I assumed Tyson had the idol. So where my mind was at when we were sitting in that tribal council is do I want to vote Ty just write Tyson's name down and we'll tie it, Tyson and Sierra, or do I want to look over to Hayden and Katie and tell them to write down Monica because... I don't think Tyson is the type of player to give up his idol. He learned. Tyson played before. <laughs> he gave up his idol. He, and, and he got voted out. So I knew Tyson's not giving up his idol. There's no way. So if Tyson is going to play the idol, he's going to play it on himself. So I turned to Hayden and Katie at that moment, which you didn't see on TV when we drew rocks. And without them seeing me, I said, Monica. And my, my thought process to that was really... Jervis had the immunity necklace. Tyson, there's no way in hell he's giving it to Monica. And I thought Tyson would not go to rocks for Monica. Because, Especially with an idol in his pocket. Because I thought that Tyson, I just didn't, I, I, my bad for not realizing how close Tyson and Monica were. That was my biggest downfall in my season is not realizing that. For a majority of the time, I thought I was Monica. And, and that, that's, where, that's where I, well, that's why I messed up, is I always thought I was number three. So obviously I didn't play perfect games, so I didn't win. But the moral of the story is I decided Monica, and I also didn't think that Tyson would play the idol. So it depends who has the idol. And, and, and for Tony to say out loud he'll give it to somebody, when he said that in that moment, I wondered, would he really? Like, would he really give it to somebody, or is he really going to just play it for himself? Yeah. And so you kind of have to evaluate the people you're dealing with, the people who – like Jeffra, they decided to throw vote Jeffra's way because come merch time, like Sarah said, we need to get rid of one of the big dogs. That's just common sense. Merch comes, we get rid of the, one of the big players. And so Jeffra was so out of the blue that, that I felt like it was a smart vote for them. All right, two more questions. One, one's from Stephen Fishback and one is from me, okay? okay. Stephen Fishback uh, wants, wants to know from last night, he wanted to know what is harder to vote out a fellow cop or to vote out your mom. Which is the uh, the more difficult thing? Voting out my mom wasn't hard. <laughs> I just <think> cool. <laughs> no, um, I would say your mom. I mean, it, it's like what's harder, voting out a fellow um, hair student. I mean, I don't know because you share the same I don't, I job mean, that you have some bond, and I don't. It was hard for Sierra. I'm, I'm not going to put it. It was hard for Sierra to vote me out, but I think she knew, like in my confessional said, I was so dang proud of her that she, sorry, that's my alarm. I oh. was so dang proud of her. Oh, my gosh. Somebody's here. Somebody's it is. Here. I was so, and she knew ultimately at the end I would be saying, way to play the game. I mean, we have a balance. You have to have a balance in your life, right? We, she knew that I would forgive her. And it wasn't easy for her to do that. I'm sure it wasn't easy for her to and do And the, the reality was is I didn't have to write my mom's name down. I mean, the, the way the votes played out, if I wouldn't have vote, wrote my mom's name down, she would have gone home anyway. 
I knew I just had to make a statement, and that's why I had the conversation with my mom before we did it. It wasn't an easy thing, but at the same time, for Sarah and Tony, you have to do the move that best fits your game, your game. Okay. And my question is, a lot of the former or the current survivors this season, this has come up a lot, where there have been some claims from the current cast that the former survivors are too hard on the current survivors on Twitter. Now I know, Sierra, you just you just uh, went went through this a lot uh, on the pre previous season. Do you think that the way that Survivor works on Twitter, that people should reevaluate things, are the the people who are the veterans are they too hard on the current cast? I don't think so. I think that okay. I played this game one time, and. I learned so much from, from playing one time that I think that you kind of, now that I'm watching those specific things that I might have messed up on or I might have learned, I'm a lot more quick to say like, hey, you know, idiot, even though maybe I was the idiot in my first season. Um, I don't think they're too hard. So, it's so much fun to watch Twitter, to like follow Twitter after the show's over. I mean, that's one of my favorite parts is to read the Twitter comments, and if those weren't there, it would be so boring. I just feel like it's an extra element to, um, not the game, because it doesn't even really matter, but just for fun, and kind of see different people's inputs, and sometimes I'll read yeah, some but, people's comments, and I'm like, no, stupid. But there are a handful of Twitterers that just can't get over the fact that they're not in the game anymore. <laughs> they're just Or like, they haven't been for like And they haven't seasons. been for a couple of seasons and it just kills them and they are the professionals now and this is what and they take it amongst themselves to be like, You're stupid. This is what you should have done and 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 they make it personal and those are the people that are just like, Okay, your fifteen minutes are up, get off Twitter, nobody listens to you anyway. And, and it's those people that sometimes will go too far, and then when you call them out, they're like, oh, I was just joking. I was just playing. It's just all in fun and games. And you're like, yeah, no, you weren't. You just got called out. I, so, I see. I totally see both sides. I just enjoy, like, following the Twitter yeah. comments, and I almost enjoy, um, like, I mean, I got called out by Eliza a number of times, and clearly she likes to, like, get in there and call people out. But my thing is if you're going to call people out, make sure you can take it back. Like, you, you kind of got to be able, if you're going to dish it out, to, to take it. So, Eliza. You gotta be, and you got to be fair and balanced. I mean, you got to, if one week you're saying somebody made a stupid move and the next week you're going, man, you impressed me, then that's then that's totally fine if you're going to be fair and balanced. But if you're just going to be, you get somebody, gets under your skin and you just ride them the whole time and you're just constantly bashing them, then move on. Get a life. Okay. Well, it's so many different layers with the Survivor. There's, every, there's the things that happen on the island, there's the things that happen in the show, there's things that happen on social media. So it's all it's all uh, great fun. Uh, Laura and Sierra, thank you guys so much for uh, coming on with me and being so generous uh, with your time today also. Thanks for having us, Rob. Yeah, well, uh, all the best to you guys. Uh, now, if you want to follow Laura or Sierra on Twitter, uh, give us your, your Twitters if, if you want to uh, see what they have to say on social media. Mine's at Laura Moret. That's it. At Sierra Easton. Pretty simple. Pretty simple. Very simple. All right. Anything else that you guys are, are uh, doing that's fun or anything that you want to let people know about? Oh. Uh, we could, but we'd have to kill you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want that. Uh, all right. Well, guys, thanks again so much. I really appreciate you guys coming on. Happy Easter. Thanks. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye.